The unusual objects have been washing up for about a decade. Personal possessions and bits of garbage. Entire ghost ships without cargo or crew appear off the American West Coast. The Tohoku earthquake and tsunami, which devastated Japan in 2011, blasted pieces of tragically disrupted lives into the sea and around the globe. And with the flood of stuff came hitchhikers, huge colonies of sea creatures suddenly able to cross an entire ocean. It became a mass rafting event, a potential environmental disaster, a scientific mystery that's still playing out 10 years later. So what happens when an earth-shaking disaster flings hundreds of species across the ocean? In June 2012, people walking along Agate Beach in Newport, Oregon came across a strange sight. An entire Japanese fisheries dock washed up on the shore. Fifteen months earlier, the tsunami had ripped it from the port of Misawa. It was more than 60 feet long and weighed 180 tons. The dock arrived just a few miles from the Hatfield Marine Science Center, where marine ecologist Jessica Miller works. You just see a massive rectangular object beached a good ways up from the access point. And we get closer and it was just covered, you know, over your head, it's over nine feet, with layers and layers of marine animals and algae. People were sort of talking about, you know, could this come from Japan? And it became pretty clear something unusual had happened. When we got there, the police department, the park service, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, all those people were there looking and wondering what they should do about it. This huge dock that recently arrived on the coastline in Oregon. I think folks looked at that picture and the word was, wow. We didn't know what it all meant, but we knew that we'd seen a spaceship. A spaceship had landed on the beach. Encrusted on the dock were more than 100 tons of living organisms, including urchins, starfish, mussels, and worms. These weren't just open ocean creatures picked up somewhere along the way. Many were coast-dwelling animals that sailed all the way to the U.S. from Japanese shores. As far as the scientists knew, this was impossible. Scientists and others that work on invasive species in the region were like, well, they shouldn't be able to survive. The ocean, these coastal species shouldn't be able to grow and thrive in that environment. What have I been doing all my life that I could be so wrong? Everything that you said before, all your lectures about how things don't go across the ocean, they're all wrong. No matter how these coastal organisms survived the journey, on U.S. shores, they posed an immediate ecological threat. The dock did have several species that were on the you know, hundred, list of the 100 world's worst invasive species. And then if they arrived in good condition, they could either sort of hop off, depending on what species they were, maybe a crab, and, and settle in our coastal zone, or they could reproduce and end up establishing themselves on our coast, which can have negative ecological and economic consequences. Often a species that is not native to an area doesn't have natural predators or other control on its abundance. They can really grow fast and expand their coverage to the point where they really disrupt the ecosystem. Maybe we shouldn't be surprised that critters with names like dead man's fingers and skeleton shrimp could have a scary ecological impact. Take the northern Pacific sea star. Or as I like to call it, the northern horrific sea star. Invading sea stars in Australia gobbled up the sites where a creature called the spotted handfish lays its eggs, leading the handfish to become critically endangered. The sea stars can also cause economic damage, depleting fisheries and harming the commercial shellfish trade. So how do you make sure these potentially invasive species don't escape the dock? I had a team just scraping and shoveling. Dug a giant hole up the beach, buried everything. Deep under the sand. Then they came with blow torches, which I think was excessive, but I'm okay with that. To make sure there wasn't much, you know, anything living left. They just showed up with a crew and torched it. And we were in the lab trying to figure out what species they were, and we would get the microscope out, get the books out, um, start calling people and trying to identify what we had. 
As authorities scrambled to intercept the debris and its stowaways, scientists like Miller and Chapman had a mystery to solve. Why hadn't this kind of large-scale, transoceanic migration happened before? And how were these creatures staying alive so long at sea? Meanwhile, the dock wasn't even the biggest or weirdest thing to make it across the Pacific Ocean. Okay, thanks, Danny. Bye. Thanks, Lyman. In April 2012, up in the Gulf of Alaska, the U.S. Coast Guard opened fire on an empty fishing boat called the Royan Maru. The 200-foot-long vessel had drifted at least 4,500 miles from Japan. The owner in Hokkaido didn't even want it back. Invasive barnacles weren't the only problem here. Ghost ships are dangerous, floating in and out of busy shipping lanes and potentially causing collisions. Our mission was to ensure that this vessel would sink and not pose any more threat to the mariners in its way. Early in the afternoon, the Coast Guard started blasting the Royon Maru. All right. It finally sank at around 6.15 p.m. Some of those species on the ghost ships can survive an amazingly long time. We know that some of those ships from the tsunami debris are still out there 10 years later. Other small boats washed up in places like Hawaii, Washington, and California. One small skiff that landed in Washington after two years at sea arrived with a striped beakfish, a potential invader, just casually swimming around inside. It was exhibited at the Seaside Aquarium in Oregon, thousands of miles from its home. And then there was the tsunami hog. In April 2012, a beachcomber on British Columbia's Graham Island found a washed-up Harley-Davidson with Japanese plates. It was traced back to Miyagi Prefecture, one of the areas in Japan worst hit by the tsunami. When I looked at the picture he took, I knew immediately it was my bike. It was a real eye-opener in the middle of the night. Yokoyama donated the bike to the Harley-Davidson Museum in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where he felt it would, quote, honor those whose lives were lost or forever altered by the disaster. Like much of the other Japanese tsunami marine debris, along its journey, the Harley had become an unlikely home for barnacles and other marine life. Sure, this is probably the first case of an arthropod riding a motorcycle across an entire ocean. But this is far from the first time an animal booked their own long-distance trip by sea. Plenty of organisms spread themselves around via waterways. There are plant seeds that evolve tiny air pockets for flotation, or a waterproof coating to survive soggy situations. In fact, rafting across bodies of water played a big part in how animals and plants got to where they are now. Like the New World monkeys of Central and South America, thought to be descendants from early African primates who rode masses of dirt and plants across the ocean. Wood or pumice can float around, and it is probably how species have moved around the globe in the past. If you walk on beaches, you'll find. You'll find it everywhere. But wood rots and sinks, so long-distance trips across the ocean were technically freak accidents, often occurring millions of years apart. What happened after the tsunami was different. The Japanese shoreline was highly developed, with buildings, docks, boats, and other infrastructure, much of it made from plastic. When a once-in-a-lifetime seismic event collided with that century of plastics buildup, it created a phenomenon the scientists had never seen before. A field of super durable seafaring garbage massive enough for colonies of creatures to really sink in their teeth, or tendrils, or whatever. So a lot of coastal invertebrates are drifting in the water column with some ability to swim, and they need to find a hard substrate. But now you had millions of tons of debris out there that could settle everywhere. They would land on a refrigerator or a tire or a tree and make their way across the Pacific. This rafting event was unique because the sheer size of the debris field allowed so many hitchhikers to survive. The colonies became pretty diverse, and with the floating objects so close together, rafters had plenty of opportunities to eat or mate with each other. But it also forced scientists to reckon with how plastics have permanently changed how our oceans function. Plastic debris has created a bridge across the ocean. The ocean used to be a barrier that prevented things from spreading. Now this debris 
has created this surface across the ocean that's doing all these things that we don't know about, that we're only now just lifting up the carpet and looking underneath there. This new term for it is the neopelagic environment. So the new pelagic environment that's created by this plastic debris that's almost indestructible. It underscores the future interaction between our growing population and our coastal development and, and sea level rise and climate change and increasing storm frequencies, potentially making this type of event less of a once in a lifetime and maybe a somewhat more frequent occurrence. Even with all the creatures the tsunami hurled across the ocean, it seems like at least this time, we got lucky. Ten years later, there's no evidence that any of the potentially invasive rafters have successfully established themselves in North America, though only time will tell for sure. That we haven't found the introduced species does not mean that they're not there. It means we haven't found them, that's all it means. And while the stream of tsunami debris has finally slowed to a trickle, there are still two entire docks, just like the one that washed up in Oregon, that no one ever found. Where are they? They're in the ocean or they're on a beach somewhere. These docks are exceedingly well made, and so it's unlikely they sank. So it's not clear where they are or when they might show up. Yeah, it'll be marine debris. The need is now and it is urgent. Those are the words of an Oregon state senator on the tsunami debris cleanup. My constituents, to be very honest with you, are asking, with this debris already here, what's the plan? How are we going to deal with this? And how are we going to clean it up? There's just the billions, trillions of little bits of styrofoam scattered all over everything. It's kind of an impossible job. There was a lot of, lot of work to be done. The first tsunami debris was styrofoam chunks and oyster culture floats. They're like big black jelly beans. Russ Lewis is a retired Bureau of Land Management ecologist and a longtime Washington beachcomber. Starting in uh, 2012, um, I started uh, picking up trash, and I've been doing that for uh, tw uh, 10 years now. A uh, couple thousand trips to the beach. And Sorry, did you say a couple thousand? Yeah, yeah, we're out there, you know, oh. uh, during the wintertime, uh, maybe, you know, four or five trips a week because uh, stuff's coming in, uh, and you got to keep ahead of it. Uh, Russ Lewis would walk the beach every day uh, picking up trash and documenting what he saw. And so then he's basically kept a dumpster of tsunami debris and would log it assiduously every day. He is a very observant person and he recognized the tsunami debris and he kept track of it. I was collecting specimens for John Chapman and, and some others. Any potential tsunami debris, check it over for uh, any kind of you know marine life that's attached to it and label it, you know, bag it up and put it in your freezer. What were some of the craziest things, not living um, or unnatural, that you just saw arrive on the beach? I found a couple of mannequin heads. The refrigerator was definitely a big one. I picked up 60 wheels in one season. There was a little Buddha, a really cool wooden Buddha. Some trash has a story to tell. You find these things and you try to find the people. They may not be alive. And luckily, I think nine items that we've gotten returned to people uh, we've found them all uh, safe and well. David Baxter is a radar communications technician on a small island in the northern Gulf of Alaska. It's really a magnet for uh, marine debris. He and his wife Yumi were the first people to return tsunami-swept items to their owners in Japan. It all started when David found a soccer ball covered in Japanese writing. He has a, his whole name, full name, in the, his uh, cool. school name. So that we pinpoint right. uh, for sure that came from Tohoku. We weren't sure that he's still alive either, because you saw the pictures of what happened over there, and it was just so sad. Well, here we go. We're packing up the uh, soccer ball. With the help of government agencies and the Japanese media, they found the ball's owner, a 16-year-old tsunami survivor in Rikutsen, Takata. I'd never have imagined that my football could have traveled thousands of kilometers and make it all the way to Alaska. I've yet to recover a single one of my personal belongings, so I'm really happy about this. Since then, the Baxters have kept working to connect people with these mementos of their pre-disaster lives. We've uh, traveled to the Tohoku region uh, three times. There's a restaurant sign 
that we returned to Minami Sanriku, this uh, dear lady that became a good friend of ours. It just, I think, behooves us to try to connect with the people and try to become friends with the other people in the world. Even amid a devastating humanitarian crisis, when the debris started to wash up on foreign shores, Japan created a gift fund, directing millions of dollars to U.S. states dealing with the influx. The Japanese government felt very responsible, even though they were dealing with their own catastrophe of the tsunami and Fukushima, they felt responsible for the debris that they were sending our way. So they contributed nearly a million dollars to help remove that dock. Japanese environmental nonprofits led delegations of volunteers to help clean up North American shores. They've arrived on our shores for a unique vacation. 70 Japanese students are headed to the beaches of Uklulet to clean up debris washing up on our shores from the 2011 Japanese tsunami. One thing that I look at is the closeness of the people from Japan to Alaska. Uh, you know, we're across the Pacific Ocean, but we're really connected as people because of the ocean. The oceans are you know, 70 percent of the planet. They have a lot of the food and the climate control that we need to stay as a viable species on the planet. And so keeping that a functioning ecosystem, I think, is a really important goal of humanity. The world is just smaller than it's ever been. And while that might mean new ecological threats, in a way, it's also a comforting thought. Shifting climates and growing natural disasters are a planetary problem. So we're gonna have to stick close if we wanna survive.